Yeah, hi everyone. Um, pretty special day today, I think, not just for all the teachers who've been trying to organize this international project, but I think also probably for you. You may not realize the implications of what we're about to do and uh, gonna do for the next two years or so, but it's gonna be massive. And I, I can assure you that for years uh, to come, you will remember these inputs you've received here and, and the, um, the issues we're gonna be talking about. And for me, it's also special. I do quite a few presentations on the climate crisis as it is, but I've never done to five countries simultaneously. For me, it's also a first. The title here, if you look at the title, it's um, One Planet, One Climate and One Last Chance. It may sound like something extreme, maybe exaggerated to say there's one last chance, but I'm gonna show you some, some data, some information that will make you believe that it's true that the time, the next five to 10 years is gonna to be totally decisive for us, not just for you, your generation, but for all the generations who are currently on this planet. We are the last ones who will have a positive influence on the, on the climate. Those following behind us in 10 years time or so, if we don't change things around, the next generations won't have the ability to steer against and stabilize the, the climate. When you look at this beautiful photo taken from outer space and you look down on our planet Earth, you just see land masses, you see continents, you see, you see the ocean. What you do not see is borders or, or boundaries. When we draw maps of the Earth's surface, we tend to have lines that demarcate countries and borders. But for the climate, these borders do not exist. They simply aren't there. And what I really like about this project that you guys are participating in now is the international focus. The climate doesn't care about borders. We're all going to be affected by it equally. So that you have come together as Europeans and are dealing with the same issue is a fantastic effort and it really needs to be, be commended. This is probably the most intuitive, the best way of illustrating temperature change on our planet for the last you know, few hundred years or so. On the left-hand side in blue, these are the periods close to when industry started to produce things and we started to burn fossil fuels, gas, oil, coal. The temperature was nice and stable. It was very low on average. And as you move across to the right, this is the last few years. And you can see it's turning red, dark red. This is the temperature anomaly, the, the deviation from what it should be. And you can see, especially the last five or 10 years, it's gone up and up and up. And now on our planet, on average, we are 1.2 degrees above what it used to be. Now, 1.2 doesn't sound like a lot, but I'm gonna show you some examples what 1.2 is already causing to our ecosystems and everything else on the planet. When you signed up for this course, you may have thought, ah, this is something different. I can get away from mathematics, from, from English, from chemistry, physics, maybe things I don't like so much. But in reality, you find all these subjects are all important for understanding the climate crisis. We cannot understand what's going on and what is likely to happen if we ignore these subjects. So even in this little lecture here today, you're going to get some, some of everything, physics, chemistry, mathematics, everything is going to be part of it. Now you've all been around for long enough to have gone through heat waves already. Um, we had a severe one in 2018 that was over most of Central Europe. We had six weeks of extreme high temperatures, hardly any rain in most parts, no winds, and the weather system was stagnant. It just stuck on the ground. And 2018 was our first year where even in Europe, our food production was not matching our own requirements. The harvest of, of different types of you know, corn, wheat, barley, all of these, these grains in 2018 was down from what it used to be. And there's a figure here for Europe alone. There was more than 16 million tons of grain that could not be harvested because it was too hot, it was too dry, and our harvests were much below the average that we expected. If we had a situation like this literally every year, then we would run into food deficiency. We would not be able to feed our, ourselves and, and the animals. Um, this is quite an extreme example, but it can also happen in Europe. And after the last two years, especially in, in Central Europe, maybe in Romania, maybe also in, in Germany here, 
we see the forests are dying. They're, they're dying through a combination of heat and water stress. They're just not getting enough water. And this little map down here on the right shows you parts of Germany in red where the water table is so much below the ground that the trees cannot reach the water with their roots. So they, they dry up at the top and they die. And we have a, a little beetle that comes in and, and neat feeds on them and the whole system collapses. So even the forests, our mainstay of our economy for many, many years are now showing signs of falling apart. For a lot of, for decades, people have thought in Europe, we are safe from this. Climate change, this is happening somewhere else. It's in the, the global south, as we call it, maybe in India, Pakistan, maybe in Australia, maybe somewhere. And we always felt Europe is safe. We don't have anything to worry about. But the uh, figures shown here, this is the temperature deviation for European countries or countries of the world. But look at the European countries in here. We have Germany, 2.1 degrees above what it used to be. Denmark, plus 1.9. Spain, plus 1.3. Turkey is down here somewhere as well, 1.7. Every single European country is warming up quite fast, quite rapidly. And when you look at these countries here in the middle, they're all Central European countries. And they have the highest rate of temperature increase the last few years. This is an example from 2019. Um, but, you know, it's this, this is happening right throughout Europe. So this is twice as fast as the rest of the world on average. We are right in the middle of this. Climate change is also happening on our doorstep. I'm a marine biologist. Um, when I was about your age, I had to make a decision. What job, what profession would I want to get into? And I was lucky. I had a a French diver who invented the diving gear to go scuba diving underwater. And he showed the first pictures of coral reefs from the Red Sea, from, from Egypt. And I was fascinated. I decided, mm, I want to get into marine science myself. So science and the oceans has always been my thing, my fascination. And this ocean covers two thirds of our planet's surface. And if we didn't have the ocean and this mass amount of water, in fact, you and I, none of us would be sitting here today because what we've already done to the atmosphere by emitting all these you know, CO2, all these gases that are affecting our climate, we have increased the temperature so much already. And if we didn't have the water mass that absorbs most of this heat, we wouldn't be here anymore because our planet would be on average 10, 12 degrees warmer than what it is now. The oceans are saving us. You know, the oceans are absorbing the heat that we're trapping in the atmosphere. And these things here, these big yellow cylinders, they're like a giant thermometer. This is almost like measuring the fever of the ocean. These dots here on the, on the map, they show you locations where these thermometers are drifting in the ocean. And the fa fantastic thing is, we can tell these thermometers from a satellite, go diving, go into the water, dive deep down. They go down and they record every meter the temperature of the water, right down to 2,000 meters, two kilometers depth. Then they come back up, they record the temperature again, and via this antenna, they connect to the satellite and they give us all their data. So a minute later, we know how warm it is in all these different parts of the ocean. And from that data set, we know something scary is going on. These are data from these thermometers, and it shows you how the, in the last 20 years in particular, the temperature of the ocean water, so not just the air on land, but the ocean waters are going up, rapidly going up. So we have heat waves, not just on land, but we also have heat waves in the ocean. And when you look at this number down here, you might be just totally overwhelmed looking at all these zeros. This is the, the amount of energy the ocean waters are absorbing in one year. And it is equivalent to 10 Hiroshima bombs, nuclear bombs going off every second for an entire year. That is the amount of energy that the oceans are absorbing for us. They are, they are absolutely saving us. They are stabilizing our, cl our climate. Without the oceans, we would have stuffed it up already, no doubt. 
what is all this heat doing in the oceans? Well, for one thing, it's destroying one particular ecosystem, which I really, really admire and love, which is coral reefs. When I decided to go into marine biology, the coral reefs is what fascinated me most. I wanted to study those. That's what a normal reef looks like. I decided when I, when I finished school, I actually went to Australia and I went to a university in Australia to study coral reef ecology. And that was my first uh, area of, of, of study for 10 years, uh, roughly about 10 years. This weird looking creature here, that is a starfish, a sea star that feeds on, on the corals. It eats the corals away, so it can destroy reefs. And when I started in marine science, this strange looking thing was, it was the biggest threat to the survival of coral reefs, everyone believed. But that belief, that belief changed. In 1998, we had the first major heat wave across the oceans from the Indian Ocean into the Pacific Ocean. And the water temperatures got up to 33, 34 degrees underwater, down to 20 meters depth. I was, I was diving in Seychelles and I took this photo here in 1998. And this whitening shows you a coral in complete distress. It is so stressed that it's ejecting pigments under its own skin. And these pigments it uses to produce food. Yeah? And this, this food is lost once the pigment is expelled. This coral was suffering so much heat stress that it got rid of all these algae in its skin. And then, then it has eight days, maybe nine days, because it can't get food and it starves. And the reefs of the Seychelles and other re reefs in the Pacific Ocean, they died in 1998 because of heat. This man here, he was my supervisor at the University of Brisbane. And in 1998, so 23 years ago, he sat down and he took all the climate data and he did an analysis. He looked at it and said, hmm, if we keep on producing so much CO2, so much gas in the atmosphere, we're probably going to have really hot water every year, every summer, by about 2050. That was his prediction. And the reality was, these are pictures from 2016 and 17, so much, much earlier, when on the Great Barrier Reef, every summer now, the corals were bleaching. So the prediction of science is always extremely careful and cautious. Science does not exaggerate. Science does understate. We are always cautious, because we need to be very, very certain of what we're claiming and what we're saying. And these are pictures from last year. This is March, April 2020 in Australia. The Great Barrier Reef, the biggest reef system on the planet, has now bleached the third time in the last five years. That frequency of disturbance cannot be sustained. And the prediction now is that maybe in the 2030s, we might lose entire reefs from parts of the Indo-Pacific. This would make it the first ecosystem anywhere in the world that actually gets destroyed by climate change. And this photo here, it looks absolutely horrible. This is a reef that has died because of climate stress. And I've included it here because on that dive in 2018, I decided enough for science, um, I can't do it anymore. And I decided to go into climate communication. We know enough, we know what is happening, but we're not taking enough action. We're not changing things around. But now we have five or 10 years left to change things. We all need to talk about climate change because it affects the very basis of our life. This colorful graph shows you something really, really important. We have four different colors, dots going up and down, up and down, up and down. These are measurements of carbon dioxide, CO2 in the atmosphere. And it doesn't matter where you measure it on the planet. Wherever you take a measurement of CO2, it goes up over time. It goes up and up and up and up. And we have the blue and the red lines, they do this. They go up overall, but they also every season, they go up and down. And what this is showing you is the earth literally breathing. This is CO2 being absorbed by the trees, by the plants during spring and summer on the northern hemisphere. As in winter, the leaves are shed, everything you know, kind of cuts down, we don't have much sunshine, 
the CO2 is not taken from the atmosphere, it stays, stays in it. So the high values, this is always in winter. The low values is always in summer. So this is showing you the earth is breathing, the plants are breathing, and they are taking CO2 out. But irrespective of where you are, it's going up and up and up. And that's, that's terrible for us. This graphic is really fascinating. Look at it closely. It looks really quite old. It's, it's an old style graphic. In a digital age, you would not expect to see that. This graphic is from 1982. This is more than 40 years old, or on, on to 40 years old. And it shows you the concentration of carb carbon dioxide here. We're in the year 2021. And here it shows we should be at about 1.2 degrees additional temperature. And that's exactly where we are in 2021 on our planet, on average, plus 1.2. So it falls in here. And this band shows you which way we're going to go if we keep on adding more CO2 to the system. This is predicting what is going to happen. And this graph was made by scientists from an oil company in the 1980s. Oil and gas companies who produce fossil fuels, they knew more than 40 years ago, if we keep burning this stuff and releasing it into the atmosphere, we're going to increase the temperature. They knew it always, but they've denied it in the last, in the last decades. And if you want to have a look at this, it's absolutely fascinating. I recommend you go to a site, uh, climatefiles.com. You find all the documents from the oil and gas companies in the United States from the 1970s and 1980s. Internal documents that were kept secret for a long time. Now they're open. You can have a look at them. And then you realize that what they've done over the last 40 years is totally deliberate. They always knew this was going to happen. And what is happening now? Where do the temperatures increase massively? And this photo of the globe here, again, shows you something remarkable. Orange is temperatures between one and two degrees warmer than what they should be. And the reds is two to three or even more degrees warmer than what they should be. And look where we find the orange and the red, predominantly in the Northern Hemisphere up here, and especially in the Arctic. There's really strong piles of, of heat up there. But again, Europe, we are right in the middle of it. Now, it shouldn't be a surprise to us that the greatest temperature increase is in the Northern Hemisphere, because that is too where we are, you know, the industri industrialized nations. Most of the population, most of the land mass is in the Northern Hemisphere. This is where it's all happening. So it's no surprise that we also get the highest increase in temperature. The Southern Hemisphere has more ocean. The ocean absorbs some of the heat and keeps it away from us. So this is why down there it is not as extreme as what it is in the North. The temperatures are continuously changing and they're now increasing at a really rapid rate. The projection now is that if we do everything, we always have been doing it. So we keep on burning fuels, gas, everything else, coal. If we keep doing this by about 2030, so this is in eight, nine years time, we're gonna go more than above 1.5 degrees. So the big target that the international community has of keeping temperature down or below 1.5, that will be finished by 2030. If we keep going the way we are, we can't reach that target. It's literally impossible. The temperatures are now in some parts of the world exceeding the range that we can actually survive as humans. As an example here from Oman in the Arabian Sea, they had temperatures of 42.6, and now the important part is that was nighttime, middle of the night, no sunshine. That was purely the nighttime temperature. And if you have humidity, moisture in the air of more than 90%, plus more than 40 degrees Celsius, that will kill us. This is our upper threshold of what we can survive. If we get to fever level of 42 degrees, that's it for us. So they had literally that fever level exceeded um, these are now the temperatures we're getting in some parts. 
This I highly recommend to you that you go to this website at some stage, carbonbrief.org. This shows you a brand new kind of science, which is really spectacular. It's called attribution science. Attribution science looks at extreme weather events anywhere on the planet. It records them and then it analyzes, could this have happened without humans burning fossil fuels? It does an analysis. And every dot on this map that is in red, it could only happen because of us, because of what we are doing. And then if you click on these buttons, it shows you all the research, all the science that was done to work that out. It is really fascinating. I highly recommend you look. You might find examples from your particular country even and how they interpreted it. Really good stuff. So now we need to go to the Arctic. The Arctic us in northern Europe or in central Europe as well determines our future. What happens in the Arctic will determine it. We're looking down on these, these circles here. In the middle, you have the North Pole. So we're looking from space onto the North Pole. And again, the color red means heat building up, temperature going up. And you can see how in the Arctic, we're dark red, which is five or six degrees warmer than what it should be. So the Arctic is warming up twice to, in some places, three times as fast as the rest of the planet. It's going really rapidly. This is the temperatures, and this is what's happening to the ice. So every, every decade, every year, we're getting less and less ice covering the Arctic in summer. Now, you might go, well, ice, no big deal. What's, what's, what does ice have to do with me in, in Central Europe? The rate of loss of the ice in the Arctic is now so, so massive, so rapid, that we have periods in summer when there's open water and no ice. And if we have open water as opposed to ice, something really nasty happens. If you have ice um, in, in summer and the sun shines on top of it, the heat energy, the light gets reflected back out into space. If the ice is missing and you have dark blue water below, underneath, suddenly that light gets absorbed. The energy of that light stays on our planet. It doesn't get reflected back out. So by having open water, blue, black water around the Arctic region, we're keeping more of the sun's energy instead of bouncing it back out, out into space. That is the loss of ice. It's making us even hotter. So we need the ice to balance our, our climate. The other thing that's missing ice, um, so we have the sea ice in the Arctic, but also in, on Greenland, for example, this huge big island, we have glaciers on top. This ice is also melting. And this is interesting for us too. The, the blue color shows relatively cold water that is mostly coming through melt from Greenland. It flows into the Atlantic and it moves down south. Then it starts to bounce into the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is our heat pump from the Caribbean. It's a current of warm water that reaches normally onto the west coast of Europe. The tr trouble now is the cold water from Greenland and the Arctic is pushing that warm current further to the south, which means what is likely to happen for Central Europe as the Gulf Stream weakens and it gets first, further pushed down, we're going to get less warmth in the water from, from, from the Atlantic, which means our climate is going to do two things in the future. We're going to have less rain on average in Central Europe, so it's going to get drier and it's going to get hotter. And our dominant force that controls our weather, it won't be from, uh, from, uh, from the Atlantic coast, it'll be from Russia, from, from Asia. So our climate here will get hotter and drier in summer and colder sometimes, but also drier in winter. So we're suffering two extremes that will become more frequent in Europe. That's the consequence of missing ice in the Arctic. Everything is connected. And the other thing it does, and you've experienced that recently, in Central Europe, we had an unusual bout of really, really cold weather for about a week or 10 days. And everyone thought, oh, winter, normal. It wasn't a normal winter. What happens when the ice starts to miss around the North Pole area? 
we don't have a nice, nice low pressure system sitting there anymore. If there's water, there's more warmth. And when there's warmth, we don't have this cold uh, air lens sitting there. It starts to move all over the planet. It's, it's a band called the jet stream. These are high altitude winds, about 10 kilometers high. They normally spin around the planet in a perfect circle. But this perfect circle is now breaking down, and it does this. It goes up and down, up and down. And now we get cold air reaching south where it shouldn't be, and we get hot air from the south reaching north where, again, it shouldn't be. This is a pattern that is now being established, and it's because of missing ice. And the trouble is, this is Central Europe. That was a winter two years ago. Very, very cold temperatures, 6 or 8 or 10 degrees below what it should be. So we have the cold. If you suck air away from the North Pole, it needs to be replaced. Some other air needs to go there. And at the same time, the warm air shot up. Here's Greenland. Here's the North Pole. And the North Pole was 10, 12 degrees warmer than it should be. So you can see the pattern here. We're completely shooting our, our climate system to pieces. We're moving it all apart, and it moves to areas where it shouldn't be. It's all because of what's going on in the Arctic. In the Arctic. Looking at the future, high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. If you have this across our planet, it's one sitting to the next, they block each other. A high pressure system that sits surrounded by two low pressure systems, it cannot move. It stays. And if that stays for six or eight weeks, like we had in 2018, we're going to get very, very hot, very dry periods. And again, we might lose our harvest, our grain harvest. And with, when this blocking pattern will now develop, imagine Southeast Asia, Central Europe, and North America, the three big grain chambers of the world where we get most of our food from. They could all come to lie under these high pressure systems. And then we have loss in harvest everywhere across the planet. This is the pattern that is now becoming more likely. It is really quite dramatic. Something else that happens in the Arctic, which is equally bad for us. It's the melting of the permafrost. The permafrost is a thin layer, just a few meters of the top soil, the top layer of the earth, which always used to be completely frozen. Like in a freezer, you know, we have the lid on top, it stays on top. Everything below is frozen solid. What now happens, because we are warming up the Arctic, this upper layer of soil starts to thaw. Um, air can get in, water can get in, and suddenly this rich layer of dark brown soil below is starting to melt, and it can decompose. And when you decompose something that is rich in carbon, that's the black stuff, you know, carbon is in here, you are releasing CO2, and you're also releasing methane. That's another gas which we don't want in the atmosphere. Methane is even worse than CO2 because it is more than 30 times as effective at trapping the heat in our atmosphere. Methane is far, far worse. It doesn't last quite as long, but it keeps more of the heat on our planet. And if we now open this lid. We're now getting methane in the atmosphere in increasing levels. You probably haven't seen these, these pictures as yet. Last year, um, Siberia, central Siberia and Russia, was extremely hot. They had temperatures of 37, 38 degrees in the Arctic regions of Siberia. And what happened there, this is a photo taken of a bit of land that used to be quite flat. And now you see it's being lifted, it's raised up, and there's starting to be these cracks in it. These are bubbles of methane that are building up under the soil and they're pushing up the earth, and eventually they just explode. And we now have, um, across the, the tundra in, in Russia, areas where these craters are appearing. These are blowholes, these are craters, almost like bomb craters, where methane has exploded. And it's not just once or twice. You know, on one peninsula in Russia there, they have more than 7,000 of these things, and they're giving us more and more methane. Again, this is something that's never happened before. This is in the last, last few years. The same melting is happening also in the Himalayas. 
really important when we think about the future of Asia. The Asian continent is the most populous continent uh, on the planet. And now we have predictions that all the glaciers in the Himalayas are threatened in the next, next few decades. If that happens, you have two and a half, three billion people in, in India and China without water supply. This is what we're currently producing. The likelihood increases every year. So I hope that you're now getting a sense for just how dramatic the situation is and why we don't have very much time left to, to go against it. We still have some time, it still can be done, but we've got to really hurry up. All these elements I've to talked to you about, uh, missing sea ice, melting permafrost, uh, ocean currents that are changing, all of these are so-called tipping points in the climate system. Tipping points are points when you cross them, no matter what you do after, you cannot reverse it. You cannot change it back to where it was. And we have, uh, have some information that about two degrees above what it should be across the globe is one of our big, big tipping points. Today, we are at 1.2 degrees. By 2030, we're very likely to gonna be at 1.5 degrees. And if we allow it to go to two degrees, all these tipping points will kick in and we lose control over the weather system. No matter what we do, once we cross the tipping points, it won't make a difference. Then the system becomes self-heating, self-generating. This is why the next few years are so critically important to us. We want to retain some control over what is going on. But it's actually fair to say that every human being who's on this planet here right now this genera these generations, we're the only ones who can still do something. Always remind yourself, there's tremendous responsibility in that. These are some forward projections of what it could be on the planet if we keep on going the way we are. Dark red, you know now, dark red is trouble. These are temperatures near seven, eight degrees. This is if we just let it go for another few decades. We're going to get into temperatures where virtually no ecosystem will have a chance of really you know, surviving it. And the dark red zone here, Central Europe, where we are, we are going to go, if we keep on doing business as usual, we're going to get to the seven to eight degrees, at which point, literally, we, we have lost control. I mentioned history was important to understand, if you want to understand the climate crisis. And now we're going back in history a long, long time, 60 million years. This is the Earth history and the temperature on, on planet Earth for the last 60 million years, roughly. This was us for the last 10, 12,000 years. Nice and stable, nice and predictable. We could start agriculture and we could build cities. More of us were, were showing up everywhere. But now we're doing this. We're going up into an area that we have never seen before, but the planet has already seen such a period of five, six degrees more up here. We need to go back 40, 50 million years in history. Planet already had such conditions of super hot conditions. If you go and you dig up samples that are 40, 50 million years old, and you look for fossils, you look for animals that lived in those periods, you'll find most of the animals are maximum about this sort of size. The planet itself on the surface, the ecosystems could not sustain on land larger creatures. It is just not possible. Largest the size of a cat roughly. So it means if we go to this area again, there is no way that our ecosystems will sustain us. They won't be able to do that. So this is a no-go zone. If we slip into this, can't be done. It can't be done for you know, 7.5 billion people, no chance. And once you get to these heights, to come back down to a livable climate, you need to bring 40, 35, 40 million years with you to allow the system naturally to restore, to recover. We don't have that sort of time. This is really fascinating. It shows you the last 2,000 odd years what the planet was actually doing before we started um, burning things. You see that slightly, the curve is actually dipping down. It wants to go lower. It wants to cool. Our planet, before we started building things and burning things, was actually slightly cooling. Our Earth is actually moving around the sun, not in a perfect circle, but in an ellipse. 
It goes a bit like this. And we were actually distancing away from the sun. So we were naturally slightly cooling. And then we came along and bang, shooting up at a rate that is more than 10 times faster than anything that's ever happened naturally. That is the scale. That is the magnitude of what we're currently doing. And there's something else marked on this graph, which is really interesting. The issue of volcanoes, eruptions from volcanoes. When a volcano blows and all this ash goes up into the atmosphere, there's some gas in it, but there's something else in it, so-called aerosols. These are small particles, they are dust particles. And if these dust particles are get, getting blown up into the atmosphere, they cool us. They give us a cooling effect. On this time series here, every time there was a big volcanic eruption, a few years later, the temperature on the planet was going down. It was dipping down quite a lot. So aerosols in the, in, the, in the atmosphere will actually cool us down a little bit. And now comes something that's totally counterintuitive. If we stop burning coal and oil, we also stop producing aerosols, these particles. So as we clean up our CO2 in the atmosphere, which we must do at all costs, we, we must do it. We're also taking the aerosols out of the system which means that slight cooling effect will disappear. So as we are stopping burning of fossil fuels for the next 10, 20 years, we will continue to see temperature increases, no matter what we do. That is part of the truth, it's, that's a fact. We will see a rise in temperatures. The stabilization that we hope, it can only come depending on how quick we act in 10, 15, 20 years. But until then, the temperature will keep on increasing. This shows us what we need to do. Our target now, for every decade, at least a halving of, of the emissions that we're producing, at least a halving, preferably more. If we can reduce it by 60, 70%, we have a much, much better chance. But at minimum, we need every 10 years to halve it, to get eventually down to, to zero. That is our, our task. Now, it sounds overwhelming. You hear these figures, you see the numbers, you see the graphics, you go, where do we start? It's not that hard, actually, because we know who the emitters are. We know where it's coming from. It's literally about 100 companies in the world that are producing more than 70% of all the emissions. It all has to do with oil and gas. We have to wean ourselves off that, and we've got to get these companies under control. That is what is holding our future currently in, in their hands. And if we allow them to hold that, then we do lose control. But it is quite clear where we need to, where we need to start looking. So renewables, renewable energy is, is the biggest thing. We need to give preference to that left, right, and center. A building like this one, it needs to be covered in solar cells, absolutely. Um, there needs to be links to geothermal energy. There should be a few more windmills on the, on the hills behind here. All this needs to happen. Now we need to really go and make that transition. This to me is the, the best summary that I have seen of where we stand. Um, this presentation, we'll share it with you. You get, get a PDF from that. You can always look at that. But this graph really shows where we are. This is the honest truth. This, is, this should be your guide. This should be how you measure what is being done. Is it effective? Is it meaningful? Can we, can we go with that? I'll leave it there. You can have a, have a read of that later. I think you now understand why it is so important that we start moving. Shutting off an industry is one thing or transforming an industry is one thing. But what we also need to do, and that is, is the second part of the challenge, is to restore our ecosystems. Nature is what stores carbon from the atmosphere. Every tree, every living creature, every insect, everything you see is carbon stored, is carbon in a body, in a living thing, which is not round in the atmosphere. We need to value and, and, and appreciate nature and forests and everything else much, much more than what we do. And we need to restore and we need to stop exploiting because this, this is the sink where all the carbon can get absorbed. Now, we already have so much carbon in the air that needs to go somewhere, and we need to get it back into living things. That is the challenge. 
action is what is needed serious action not just talking about it anymore we know where we stand we know the truth and the good thing is we have all the answers we have the solutions we have the technology that can change things we know what to do and for valuable 10 more years we have the ability to use that that knowledge those skills to really do make a difference it can be done but not starting in 2030, starting now. So at that point, let's all get into this. Um, I'm super excited that all of you have chosen to participate in this program. I think it's fantastic. And it, it will put all of you participating in a, in a very good frame for, for the years to come. The topic of the climate crisis, as much as we wish to, um, it will never go away. It will be part of our life throughout it cannot be any other way so we have to accept what it is we have to accept the responsibility and the solution is is coming together as as a as a community as a society that is what needs to happen all of us we are sick and tired of coronavirus we we can't stand it anymore we're, we're bored we want to be free again we want to join again come together and we're not allowed to but by being separate, we have a chance of protecting ourselves. With the climate crisis, it's exactly the opposite. We need to come together to address this. So let's start this race and let's start some questions and let's hope we will uh, exchange many more times in the next couple of years. Thank you for listening. I wanted- We listen to your yes. questions. So you said- sure. Yes, please. You said to, uh, we had to talk to uh, companies who are uh, making a lot of change in the atmosphere and do making a lot of uh, that, that gases, I don't remember the name, that gases. Uh, what would be the way uh, to talk to them? What would be the, the way to uh, convince them to stop doing that to stop uh, uh, pollution because it's not in my hands but i think we could do something what would be that way to to stop that people because well people or or companies or or whatever they will be okay <clears throat> yeah um I, the question was what do we really need to do what is the solution for for tackling this big emission, the sources of these gases that we cannot afford to have anymore? It is the ultimate question. It, it is a very difficult question. But the thing is, if we ask the question without having a solution of how to transform and change, it would be difficult. But we do have the solution. I'll give you an example from Germany, because I know it best. The German government has agreed to allow coal-fired power plants to continue operating till 2038. That is ridiculous. Uh, we cannot afford to do that. That cannot be allowed to happen, but the government has said so. But people are now realizing that we don't have that much time. We need to stop by maybe 2025, 2028, so much, much earlier. And the knowledge that we have, that needs to be and a lot more people need to realize what the true situation is where we really stand. So the answer is, use the knowledge, use the truth, know what you, what you know, and spread it much, much more. Everyone who understands about the climate needs to become a messenger, someone who talks to others. The most important thing you can do is to talk everyone in your, in your family, in your circuit, talk to your politicians, talk to the media, get the truth out. If the truth that I've presented to you today, if more people knew this, then I'm pretty sure the pressure on these companies that are you know, taking our future would be much, much greater and the change could happen very quickly. So what we need to do is we need to produce as a community, as society, we need to produce a social tipping point where, where we all say, no, this cannot go on. This cannot continue. We need to make that transition. So the social tipping point before the climate tipping points and we win the race. It's us. It's literally in our hands. We, we just, what, what Greta Thunberg has initiated. Now the movement that happened 
sadly it was it was cut short because of corona um that needs to liven up again this needs to start again it can only be communal pressure that will force them to change but it can happen and we still have those few years those few precious precious years okay we have questions from uh, i think from turkey yeah karen karen yes my name is Karen Turjala. I'm from Turkey. Does smoking affect the ozone layer? Didn't get uh, could you please repeat it? Does smoking affect the ozone layer? No, ozone layer. Yes. No, luckily, no, luckily it doesn't. The, um, the, um, the, ozone the ozone layer is a very, very high altitude layer, and it's more affected by, by radiation, um, and it's more more chemistry that goes on there. But this little bit of smoke produced that is produced at our level, at our level um, never, um, never even reaches there. there. It, it gets changed before, before so, the so the ozone layer is not much affected by it. By it. Different, different chemicals will do it, but the, the climate gases, gases don't have, don't have much effect on the ozone. Very, 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 very minute. There's a question. There's a question. Yeah. yeah. Very, very good, good question. question. The graph, the graph I, showed I showed actually went back, went back to about 55 million, million, million years ago. ago. What, happened what happened 60 million years ago, something nasty came out of space, a big meteorite. 60 million years ago, it was the coast of what is now Mexico, this meteorite hit, and it actually caused the, the extinction of the dinosaurs. That was the age of the dinosaurs. This meteorite incinerated all the forests there was there were fireballs everywhere so literally the world's forests were burning down now imagine what happens first when you put aerosols in the atmosphere you get the cooling effect so the forests are being burned it cools the earth means photosynthesis can't function everything is being burned so you have everything dying at the surface the dinosaurs died, the plants died, everything died. And the decomposition of, of this releases methane and CO2. So there's a chain reaction. The meteorite comes, it kills everything. The earth gets cooled because of the aerosols, which kills all the remaining plants. And everything that then lies around decomposes, produces CO2 and methane, and the temperatures go through the roof. That was the chain. That's how it happened. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are two ways that you can reduce emissions. You can switch technology. That's one way. But as you just say, also by not doing things, simply reducing consumption, behaving differently. Of course, that's a way of saving emissions. You can reduce emissions that way. So it has to be that combination of the two, clearly. That would be ideal. But I would add a third one, which I mentioned. Restore ecosystems. Wherever you have land that is just now derelict, it's not being used, restore. Put trees on there. You know, um, swamps, reflood swamps. They become wonderful sinks for carbon. All of these improve nature, uh, allow nature to reestablish itself in areas. So if we have this trifecta, better technology, less consumption, and restoring nature, if we combine those three, we can do this. We can definitely do it in the time frame that we have. We can start to see that levering down in, in five to seven years. It could be done, no doubt. It could be done just in time. But we really need to pull our finger out and get moving. Um, I think we, the technologies we have, which are the cheapest, is, is solar and wind. Why not use them? I mean, th this is the cheapest stuff. They, they don't send you a bill. Uh, if you have uh, on your rooftop here, you have everything you need and you combine it with a, with a small battery, you could be completely self-sufficient. And we also need to look at systems that are separate, that are self-sufficient, not so centralized. Because of all the changes that will still happen, regardless of what we do, we need to adapt. We need to be able to handle the situation. And adaptation becomes easier 
when we have everything we need close by. So self-sufficiency, more and more localized sources of everything we need is a very, very important key. It doesn't make sense to be dependent on a, a power plant somewhere a few, a few hundred miles away. If we have it in our own backyard, much, much better, much, much safer. It'll put us in, in better stay down the track. From the other countries. So, uh, EFSA, what's your question? Okay. Um, hi, my name is EFSA and I'm from Turkey. And I have a one question for you. Uh, it's what's the biggest reasons for climate change? The biggest uh, reason? Uh, what's the biggest reasons for climate change? Mm -hmm. The biggest, the biggest by, by far is the burning of fossil fuels. So burning oil, gas, and coal. That is about two thirds of our problem. The other really, really big problem that we have, another big source of climate change is meat, meat consumption. The production of meat, uh, of particularly cows, is, is for the planet is not sustainable. We need to use up so much land, so much good land to produce meat. We use up so much water to produce meat. Um, the meat consumption that the planet currently has is not sustainable, absolutely not. If we all decided to reduce it to maybe once, twice a week, and we stuck to that, fantastic, then we could solve it. If we keep meat production and consumption as high as what it is now, we're literally gonna, gonna eat our future. Part of our future will eat away, as simple as that. I know it sounds incomprehensible, but it's true. Think about Am of the Amazon. The Amazon forest in South America, most of the clear felling, the burning that is happening, is to make space for pasture land, for cows to graze. That is the main reason that forest disappears. As that forest shrinks, it also stops functioning like a sink for carbon. The forest is drying out, and it can't absorb the carbon anymore. So on two, two fronts, we're, we're doing something stupid. We're destroying the land and reducing the function of the forest to get carbon out of the air. So burning fossil fuels and second is meat. If you get those two things under control, we win. OK, so uh, there are more questions uh, from Ada. Akash? Yeah, yeah, I am Ada Akash. I'm speak I'm from Turkey. Firstly, thank all of you to give a chance us to ask a question to you. My question is, are we are the humans are late to save our world from climate change? Yep. yep. Governments. The question is governments. Uh, it is clear that currently not a single government in the world is doing enough to really stop what, what is coming towards us. Every single government needs to do much, much more. The agreement to limit climate change that was signed in Paris, it said how much the emissions needed to be reduced. And someone has done an analysis of what the promise is from governments and the reality, what this is. And the gap between the two is massive. I think it's literally less than 3% of all the countries who signed the Paris Agreement are doing what they said they would be doing. They're, they're literally leaving us in the lurch. And when you look at why these governments are not acting, again, I use the example, I use Germany and I can use Australia because I know that also really well. In those countries, we have a very strong lobby <laughs> of the fuel industry. And that fossil fuel industry has a direct line to government ministers. And they literally put pressure on so much pressure that the system won't change. It is the lobbyists of the big firms that are preventing the change we need to see. Governments are, I guess they've become too close to industry. Industry has more power than, than us. It has more power than politicians. We have a, even a corrupt interactions are there so you have you have lobbyism and a, a colleague of mine has has called lobbyism um, legalized corruption and i think that's a very good definition we should not have industry bodies getting direct access to a president or a minister to put pressure on not to change and to allow things to continue 
But to give you a hopeful note, the fossil fuel industry, the products, you know, the oil, the gas, the coal, is becoming so ridiculously expensive compared to renewables that it's starting to look stupid to even do that. They're now trying to keep them alive, um, these fossil fuel things, by giving um, basically free money. So, yeah, they give uh, ex extra <laughs> funds available. If these extra funds were pulled away, in the case of Germany, it's 52 billion euros each year that the German government is literally giving to the fossil fuel industry so that their products can remain competitive in the market. If you stop that one thing, this one measure, we could reduce our emissions by 30, 40% in one year, in one step. One bit of legislation, if it was changed, would give us a 30% reduction in emissions. We have these big things. We have the big sticks. We, we know how it can be done. And that is what we, all of us, need to, need to ask for and enforce that this happens. So really a, a lively democracy where we all come together and we approach the politicians and we, we, we increase the pressure. I mean, how can it be that a few hundred lobbyists from an oil and gas firm can have more power than millions of people who should also be the, we should be the biggest lobby. We are most, you know, we should really start to think about getting more actively involved in, in democracy to counter the pressure from these lobbyists. Okay, uh, Theodora, what's your question? Oh, hello, I'm Theodora, I'm from Romania. Uh, is there a way that uh, we can reverse its effect completely or we can just uh, slow it down? Ob wir es komplett äh, ähm, retten können, das Thema, oder ob wir, ob wir es nur äh, verlangsamen können, die Veränderung. Mm -hmm. The question is about, can we, can we slow down climate change? The, question, the answer is, yes, absolutely we can and we need to. But remember, for a few more years, it will keep on going up at about the same rate that we've seen the last 20 years. But once the emissions come down, after that 20-year period, it will start to stabilize and we can then start to bring it back down if we have healthy ecosystems then it can be done so stabilization at the next few years yes it can be done if you ask me the same question in 2032 and we haven't changed in between then i would say no then we've lost it but now we still can for a number of years same question here yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, when we fly we should there Mm -hmm. Is that really a good thing or is it just greenwashing? This, this is a, a really interesting question about personal choices, you know, the choice to fly or, or not to fly. I'll tell you one thing. You may have seen on, on your mobile phones, you get these apps, work out carbon footprint. You can type in what you do, how often you drive, what you fly and, and what you eat, everything else. And these apps work out what your carbon footprint is. How many tons of CO2 are you responsible for? The very first app for mobile phones was funded for by BP, British Petroleum, a big, big oil company. They produced that first carbon footprint app. Why did they do that? Because they want us to look at ourselves and feel individually responsible so we don't look at the real cause for trouble it's the systemic problem that is causing us to maybe lose our future the individual actions they are important so you can justify for yourself that you know, i'm doing the maximum possible do that it's all fine but don't expect if you stop driving or you stop flying that the system will be fine it won't because the system will carry on as it has from my point of view, if you, if you love eating meat and you love flying to, to Mallorca twice a year, keep doing that, but get engaged, get involved politically, get communities, get societies together, talk about the really big things that need to change. Individually, we cannot save the system. As a society, as a community coming together, we can, but we need to point out where where the real trouble lies not in our individual behavior. 
We only accept what is given to us. If the system gave us a cleaner, a healthier option, we would take that. We're, we're pragmatists. So always keep in mind, it's the big things, the systemic things that need to change. Individually, we can't save it. Take one from here. Metehan Simsek. Yes, uh, I'm Metehan. I'm from Turkey. Uh, first of all, I thank you. Uh, when will climate change affect people? Where, where will it affect people? Do you mean in which uh, areas of the world or in the uh... world? Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Climate change, the way it's developing, is going to affect every part of the world. There will not be a safe haven. If we allow it to proceed uncontrolled, the change is going to be so dramatic everywhere. The rate of change, like I say, it's 10 times faster than anything that's happened before. So if you believe that, you know, say, parts of Istanbul right now feels fine, parts of Romania, parts of Germany, it feels for now, it feels fine. If we don't change our ways, in some years, it won't feel fine. And we will not have safe havens. We will not have safe spaces. We're all in this together. That's why I showed the picture of the planet there. It's one planet. There is no boundary. There are no borders. We are one. Everything is connected. So don't fall for the trap to say, I'm, I'm fine here. No, you won't be. Because we're all in this together. OK, thanks. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you can. Show yourselves. Be out there. Be out there. Um, communicate on this subject. This is the most important subject that's ever come across your desk. Talk about it all the time. Communicate to others who not, don't see it as, as, as serious just yet. Communication, communication, communication. Give everyone the information. I firmly believe that if the truth as it is was understood by enough people, we would see the social change. We would see the social tipping point. There are too many running around out there who just, they've never exposed themselves. They, they've never listened. They've never gone for it. Um, so I think you talking about it is the biggest contribution you can make in any forum. And we see a lot of change for solar panels because they're less effective like burning uh, coal. And that's why if we want uh, building solar panels, we need to for the environment, especially for nuclear building, we can uh, we use uh, other energy. There's actually a myth. Um, the solar cells we have these days are so efficient. They are absolutely amazing. Now, they, they far out, outbid the efficiency of, of any fossil fuel in the meantime. No? They are simply amazing. We're getting to a stage now where we have highly flexible that could be stuck onto all sorts of surfaces. That's only a few years away. We now have companies in, in uh, Thuringia, in Thuringia. Um, they produce the most advanced solar cell in the world now. And the efficiency has gone up again tremendously. And the price is so dirt cheap that even if your unit wasn't super efficient by just adding a few more, you will get out of this trouble. Another comparison. Solar cell compared to bioenergy. Um, in Europe, we have many areas where corn is being grown, but not to harvest as food, but just get the plant matter and produce biogas out of this. They say it's sustainable because you know, the atmosphere, the plant absorbs it, then you burn it. So it's supposed to be a cycle. <laughs> the area you need for that, if you, if you plant corn somewhere, to generate one kilowatt of power, the space you need for that is 60 times as much space as you would need with one solar cell. So a field that is covered in corn that no one can eat, it's just for the plant matter, produces 1 60th, a tiny amount of the energy you could have if you stuck solar panels on that. Solar is a big part of the solution. Alternative energies can do everything we need to do. We don't need fossil fuels. We also don't need gas. We just don't need it. Um, 
Jan, uh, Jansu, please. Um, hi, I'm Jansu, and in your opinion, uh, there are two chances. Is gonna is gonna climate change uh, keep going? Are people gonna try to fix it? I mean, in the future, which one will happen? Or... Mm -hmm. I think I, I think I got what you yeah. The, the chance, what are the chance, the, the likelihood of us making the change uh, in time and doing things right? If I didn't believe that it was possible to change this, this trajectory that we're currently on, I wouldn't be here. I mean, honestly, if, if I had given up the hope um, to change things, then why should I spend my time? I'd do something else that is, that is fun. But I firmly believe that we can still do it. I know we can still do it. I, I work with the these figures and numbers all the time. I look at all the trends. I, I live this stuff 24 hours a day. This has become completely my, my subject. And because of that, I can honestly tell you that if we do the things that the science tells us to do, yes, we can save it. Absolutely. That's why I'm using every opportunity um, to talk about this. For a few more precious years, five to seven years, if we take the right steps, yes, we can save it. And yes, we can make it a a nice stable platform again from which to then fix things can be done absolutely but it's up to us it's the human factor now we can't the physics and the chemistry of the atmosphere we cannot change these are laws of physics laws of chemistry we can't play with that it will do what it will do but us what we can do is our behavior our, our thinking our knowledge base we can change that and we can change it rapidly so yes we can in that you choose the most um, energy efficient means of travel, clearly. Um, if you have to use a means of transport that you don't really like, look for ways of compensating through other measures. Um, for example, you could, I'll give you an example, um, crowdfunding is a really good way. You can, you can uh, make a project proposal on the internet on a crowdfunding site and you say, we, as a school, we've been donated so many hectares of land by a farmer. We want to put solar panels on there and therefore produce sustainable energy. And here's how we've calculated how much energy that could generate over that time. That's how much CO2 we can save. And you can compare that and write it off compared to your activity that you need to do. So basically, think about honest me methods of compensating. Don't buy funny certificates from, from some company. That's, that's nonsense. That really doesn't work. But think about ways that you can progress on that front and establish something that will justifiably change the balance of the emissions. That's what I would do. And you'd be surprised. There's so much money out there. And people now in, in Europe, in, in the whole world, you know, the interest rates are so low. And many people have money sitting there. They don't know what to do with it. Give them a good reason to invest that money into something meaningful, and you'd be surprised how much will, will pop up. That's what I would try. Okay, and we have uh, Hevin from Turkey, I think. Hi, I'm Hevin. I'm from Turkey. Um, COVID affects climate change. Yeah, what effects, that, that's what kind of, again, just reiterating the main things. Our behavior affects climate change, our choices affect climate change, and our, our consumption affects climate change. So if we choose the best possible means, the cleanest means of doing things, if we stay away from, from fossil fuels, one big step, and reducing meat. Again, this, this is, these are the two big things. If we cover those two, and also maybe get our air travel a little bit under control, then we're on a very, very good way. So it's the person, personal choices and talking to politicians. Don't forget that. Use your democracy. Use talking to politicians as a means of building up the pressure for change. These are the changes we need. Taco. Hi. Uh, I wanted to, to ask about... Um, uh, you said we have to... Um, uh, speak about the theme, uh, talk with everyone, uh, communicate, 
but at least in my in my uh, I think in a lot of cases anyone anyone wants you to talk about that because if you do that you are a freak or 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 you are a nerd or you are um well, in, in Spanish would be molestar uh, mm -hmm. or you are well it, it's not nice to listen to someone telling you what is wrong or what is nice what you have to do um and you can listen the industry of uh, artistic industry and there's any there isn't there isn't any song which talks about um this theme and uh, famous because any uh, is i think it's a theme a, a little burned uh, people are burned of this what would we do uh, to talk about this without people uh, because when you are talking about this people are not really uh, hearing you they are only telling you uh, saying yes yes it's true it's true and in their minds they are like please uh, finish talking about this i want to go home and uh, eat my dinner you know so what what we could do to people so they want they really want to listen to us mm -hmm. inconvenient yeah. <laughs> So the question is about what do we do when we're surrounded by people who don't really want to listen to the issue, who'd like to push it away, don't accept it, or might even look at you as someone a bit weird, you know, because you talk about climate. What I find works best if you encounter someone who just doesn't want to hear about it, don't talk about climate change, talk about change, transformation in their environment that is not necessarily climate related, but presents a positive view of the future. Give you an example here. When I go to the uh, neighboring communities here, there's many uh, people who work in agriculture and agriculturists, they're used to having finger pointed and say, are oh, you you're part of the problem? And they don't wanna look, talk to people anymore. So when I go now, I don't talk about what their contribution to climate, to the climate crisis is, I do something else. I say, in technology, we now have these new developments. We now have this incredibly efficient solar, solar cell. And you have the space, you have the, the land area. And if we could install those there, you would actually make more money than with your particular way of, of uh, using your ground. Uh, you've currently produced corn. This is not worth very much, but this, it would give you that. So you actually involve them in the, in the solution, in the transformation, but you don't mention the reason why this is happening. We all have different values, different perspectives. And there's some, for some people, the value, the perspective is, um, is money, quite clearly. The good thing is that a lot of the transformation, if you calculate it, it is actually smarter. It is better to do that. So find the value that responds to the person you're trying to convince. And it may not be talking about climate change, but just talk about the solutions that you know will help to address climate change, but it will also help them for their life and how they see the world. Okay, are there any uh, more questions? Ah, yeah. The German team has some questions. These tipping points, they're not absolute values. You, you can't imagine it like, oh, we reached two, now it's all finished. It's not like that, okay? It's, it's kind of a gray zone. It's a sliding scale. We don't know exactly where it is. It is an estimate of science to say at around the 2.2 degree mark, these tipping points, we might lose control over them. But it's not an absolute value. The key message is every, even just one-tenth of a degree, is super, super important and worth fighting for because we don't know where it is. It, even at that point, it's not suddenly all going to collapse. It's just going to become so much more obvious that we're losing control. But it's not an absolute point. It is not a cliff edge. Um, it's worth fighting for every tenth of a degree. But digitalization is a, a big problem too, but we can communicate with it. Is it good for the climate? On which part? The... Uh, is the digital, digital, digitalization ah, a yeah. thing for climate? Or is it, yeah. I think it's on how we use it. Or... Mm -hmm. it's de it depends exactly on that. The question is about you know, digital world, you know, controlling everything digitally. Um, it can be a solution. 
and it most likely will be if we use it smartly, but we can't use it blindly and assume it's all going to be good. Um, there are estimates from, from scientists who have worked out if we use it smartly like to how to control our energy system, we can save a lot of emissions. If we just use it for gimmicks sort of playing around here and there, it might need so much power um, that in fact it's going to be detrimental to the cause. Uh, example, Bitcoin. It's the biggest nonsense there is. You, know, you need entire power plants for this stupid Bitcoin tr trading scheme. It's, it's a disaster. And that's a purely digital thing. So digitization can go either way. But we're needed to really smartly control the energy grid. For that, it's essential. Absolutely. Uh, Theodora, do you have uh, another question? Yes, we are in a pandemic. What can we do to prevent the climate changes in this space? I mean, we are we are all home, and we can go outside, really, or things like that. I, 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 I hardly underst understood what you said because it's yeah, um, very silent. About that COVID, we are uh, stuck at home and we can't really go outside or do major changes like this. The question is about COVID and how coronavirus is affecting the whole fight you know, for the climate. For the first 12 months of COVID, um, because the whole world kind of started shutting down, we actually saved some emissions and we've worked it out. There's six or 7% of the CO2 emissions that normally would have happened, didn't happen because we shut everything down. So we did have a positive, for us, positive trend, good for the climate. But we're going to pick it up again, very likely, once we, we're kind of free to move again, it's likely to pick up. So in the short term, it was good, it was positive, um, but it, it was also negative, like I hinted at before. Us being separated, being apart, not coming together, talking about things, not being able to, to demonstrate, that was definitely a downside. Certainly the, the Fridays for Future movement got, it's still there, luckily, but it kind of got slowed down and we need to pick that up again. So the effects were short term, but I'm pretty positive that once we come out of this, this horrible situation and we're allowed to come, come together again, everyone is going to be so keen to do that and not just have party but have your party that, that's fine but don't just have a party also come together and join heads and talk about these important subjects um we, we can bring this forward it's not a the COVID stuff was not um fatal for us we can we can get over this and we can use it to realize what we actually need to do so i'm i'm not too worried about it okay i see no more no more questions um well we said it will take until uh, 11 o'clock so we are uh, in time um so uh i don't know if you have noticed that uh, we have reached uh, the maximum amount of uh, members in this meeting because it's uh, limited at 100 and we were 100 in the meeting uh, so it i think uh, I'm, I'm really really uh, pleased that uh, you all joined the meeting and uh, we were about 120 persons so joining this uh, lecture um, and I'm really really ha happy that uh, everything worked and I would like to say th thank you to our um, technical staff here um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I would uh, like uh, you to, to clap uh, give a big applause to, uh, to them because they made it possible to meet here um, <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, thank you to all the teams that you organized uh, it, that your students could uh, were able to join it. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to see the faces uh, because until now we just had some names and uh, uh, some information on TwinSpace. Um, for, uh, for the end of the session, I have some, something sustainable for uh, Udo Engelhardt as a little gift to say thank you. Very much and it has your your logo on it superb thanks very much great okay um if it's possible uh
it would be great to have a, a good photo at the end if you all light your cameras and uh, and uh, wave your hands uh, we could take some good shots for <laughs> for the newspaper for our homepage and for to document our projects and to have a good uh, um, souvenir of uh, this good time we had today so uh, if you uh, light your cameras and uh, i will show all the people you were here on the, the meeting Macht ihr auch, könnt ihr auch Fotos machen mit dem Handy? Oder ihr könnt auch meins eben nehmen. Dann, äh okay, so. Okay. <laughs> Hello. How are you? Did you like it? Same reaction in the video conference with the students. No reaction. <laughs> the action is always the same. And then on side two. Here you are. That's Inga. Hi, Denmark. <laughs> okay. Now the other was. There. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you for, for being here today. And uh, I'm looking forward to our next meetings. I think we'll uh, make uh, another meeting uh, with all the students and uh, we would like to put you in contact and uh, maybe create some uh, breakout sessions with mixed groups. Uh, so to make it possible that you get to know each other to prepare our re real meeting uh, next year hopefully in Spain <laughs> as the first meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Muchas gracias. I don't know Romanian. <laughs> okay, so how do you say it in Romanian? <laughs> okay, <laughs> goodbye and thank you. See you. Everyone. Bye. Bye. Enjoy. Bye. Keep up the good fight. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you. See you later. Bye. 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 See you later. Bye. Bye.